All right, so um, I was tasked with uh, going through some of the uh, challenges and opportunities from, uh, that would come from processing sequence data across uh, uh, different projects. And so I just uh, want to summarize some of the, the, the discussions uh, we've had around this topic. Uh, and so I guess the, the first uh, slide is just to say why. And I guess the point is that there are many analyses that one can imagine that would benefit from combining uh, information across different sequencing projects. Uh, at a high level, uh, some of the examples, uh, you could imagine that if you, can, if you have different studies that include the same trait, uh, doing a meta-analysis across those studies will nearly always be more informative than analyzing a single sample or a single one of those studies. As we try to explore the role of rare variants, it becomes really important to have uh, uh, very many uh, controls. I'll show just a small example uh, in a couple of slides. And uh, obviously we could say that you know, every single project should type thousands of controls. But I think there, there's also probably room to say that if we can coordinate analysis across different projects, we can extract many of these benefits in a, in a less expensive way. Uh, as, you, as you imagine a situation where there'll be, you know, tens of thousands and eventually hundreds of thousands of sequenced human genomes, uh, you can imagine that this will provide very high resolution information about the role of natural selection. You might search through even quite small functional elements in the genome and say, you know, which ones of those never vary or only very rarely vary when I look at hundreds of thousands of individuals. Uh, and I guess one challenge is that even uh, modest differences in uh, how sequences are analyzed in each project can make some of these analyses a, a bit more difficult. And so before uh, discussing the options in a little bit more detail, I just wanted to give uh, two very small examples. Uh, so. There's a gene called complement factor H uh, that's been associated with macular degeneration in many studies, or actually the region that includes the gene has been associated in many studies. And uh, earlier this year, uh, uh, Sumi Raishaduri, working with uh, some of the people in this room, showed that the particular rare variant uh, in the gene uh, was very strongly associated with the risk of macular degeneration. And so it turns out that we, we had uh, some sequence data for the region, and so it was interesting to see would we be able to reca recapitulate this finding in our own data. Uh, uh, you know, our, our own data included about 2,400 AMD cases and 800 controls. And if we look, we see that th this exact same rare variant that, that was described is seen in 23 cases and zero controls. So that seems very appealing, right? Yeah. Wow. But it turns out in this particular data set, because there's so few controls, the p-value is not so exciting. So if you, if you had sequenced many genes, or even if you just have many variants in each gene, you know, this doesn't really stand out. It's only in the top, you know, 0.3% of variants, but there's thousands of variants. Now, if you, if you were able to look at data from other sequencing projects, for example, if we checked, hey, what happens uh, in the 12,000 exomes that were used to design this exome chip, then you say, ah, in those 12,000 individuals, that variant is seen only twice. So seeing it 23 times in 2,000 disease cases becomes quite impressive, right? So, no, obviously you'd like to do this in a systematic way. You know, in this case, we already know the answer because uh, uh, Sumi and colleagues did a, a, a very nice analysis. But th there's probably more variants like this to find that will inform about the function of other genes. Okay, so that's, that's one side of the coin, why, why we'd like to do it. You know, uh, another side of the coin is that there, there are challenges if you, if you don't do this in a careful way. Uh, so many of you have seen QQ plots for all sorts of uh, comparisons. It's common to show them in genome-wide association studies. And one of the things you'd like to see in these plots, uh, I, I apologize if they're very faint, is that you, you hope that variants fall close to the 45 degree line for most of the variation. Uh, in, th in this particular slide, uh, we're comparing uh, exome sequence at two different centers in a, in a particular large project. 
Uh, there's a set of variants that were judged to be of lower quality, and those show many differences between centers. But uh, even, you know, something like half a percent of the high-quality variants are very different between these two centers if you take the initial calls. If you call them jointly and spend a bit of time filtering them, uh, then you get an analysis that uh, falls, you know, much closer to that 45-degree line where there's few spurious differences. You know, obviously being sequenced at one center or another in this particular project was not a phenotype. Okay. So, um, you know, so if we, if we just uh, said, you know, let's compare results between studies, probably most of the differences, most of the things that would be highlighted would be dominated by uh, data processing artifacts. Okay, so what are the options in trying to combine data across studies? Uh, you know, there, there's, there's several options. You know, you could, you could imagine s taking the simplest option where each project decides how best to analyze its own data. There, there are certainly virtues to that approach. If you spend time generating the data, thinking through it for many months, you can probably do a very good job of calling it, maybe better than uh, someone running a central analysis pipeline could do if they've only just had the first look at your data. Uh, now, for, 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 even for this, to, 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 uh, to have benefits, I think we need to spend time you know, making sure that data is in standard formats, is stored in ways that, that are queryable, uh, and that facilitate uh, analysis across studies. There's some opportunity to, to do these analysis in a more planned way. Uh, we might imagine having minimum standards for what we would like to see deposited. We'd like to, to see certain kinds of variants analyzed and stored, for example. Uh, we could even imagine making these standards quite strict and specify that certain analysis tools should be used. And this would be have the virtue of making these data sets more similar. Uh, you know, you could imagine then yet another layer, which would be to actually recall all the studies or certain groups of studies uh, centrally, and this would make the analysis the most uniform. So if we start with option one, if you, you could say, well, let's just use the calls provided by each project. Now, I think, you know, even though this might not sound super appealing, certainly in a, in a workshop that's titled, you know, what kind of central analysis can we do with sequence data, I think there's many valuable analysis that are actually relatively robust uh, to differences. If, for example, if we decided to focus on meta-analysis where we analyze each study independently and then combine results across studies, uh, those analysis can actually be very robust to what variants are called in each study, whether some study had uh, more or fewer false positives in their list of variants. Uh, and I think to be fair, uh, most of the benefits from, from, from uh, the ability to do these joint analysis, we, we're not realizing yet, you know, not just for, for sequence data, but even for genome-wide association studies. I mean, it's still quite a cumbersome process to combine um, results across a few studies, even if you just say, you know, I'm going to have low ambition, I'm just going to analyze each study, do a meta-analysis across many studies. I think t there, there are many things that uh, would be nice to, to see happen to make this more practical. You know, these range from harmonizing phenotypes, making sure that uh, data formats are, are standard and consistently used. You know, every time you decide to tweak a little bit for an individual study, for example, how you lay out the data in dbGaP, it means that, you know, any analysis that tries to combine those data sets now requires manual intervention. It can't just automatically scan across different data sets, even if you had access to several of them and try and combine results. Uh, obviously, we talked a lot yesterday about streamlining data access protocols, and I think that's also very important. Uh, so I think all these things, you know, how we store phenotypes, how we use standard formats, uh, data access, are basically, it's, there are many things to do here that have nothing to do with centrally processing data that, that have potentially very large payoffs uh, in terms of uh, models for making it easier to combine data across studies. Um, you know, I think 
there, there are differences that, that we have between studies that we could probably try and reduce, and I think this, this could be helpful. Uh, you, know, you could imagine that uh, when data is centrally deposited, you could define some minimum standards. Uh, these could be, well, we'd like to see analysis of indels in addition to SNPs or certain types of copy number variation. Uh, one important thing is that many of sequencing studies now, nowadays report variants are discovered, but it's very hard to interpret the absence of a variant. Is it because the region wasn't well sequenced, or is it because the region was very well sequenced and nothing was there? When, when you think about using uh, sample sequence by other projects as controls for your samples, it's, it's really important to have this, this detailed annotation of what could have been discovered. In, in, a, in a second project. Uh, you know, I think you could even imagine requiring that all data that's deposited is processed at least once with the same set of tools. Uh, you know, in, in, in my view, uh, I think that even if we spend time making these things happen, uh, I, I, I see the improvements as actually somewhat incremental in relation to option one. I think if each data set is processed separately, even if it's processed within the same tools, uh, there will be still important differences between data sets that make it impossible to directly combine data. That you're still limited to doing meta-analysis uh, kinds of approaches. Uh, you know, for example, it's common now in sequencing projects to use a series of filters to remove uh, variants that are likely to be artifacts. Those filters depend quite a bit on things like sample size. So if you have a a large or a small project, the quality of variant calls is probably going to be quite different, even if you analyze them with the exact same tools. Um, option three, you know, what if you try to uh, jointly analyze data across many projects? Obviously, this would be the most computer la and labor intensive because it requires things to happen that wouldn't happen by default. Uh, there are many analyses that you could imagine uh, benefit from larger sample sizes. If you're trying to discover uh, new variants, as you have many more individual sequence at a particular position, you have more, it, it's easier to discover variants where uh, evidence might have been marginal across many samples. Uh, if you're trying to resolve complex events, breakpoints for structural variation and things like that, it's really, really helpful to have uh, sequence information across many samples. If you want to resolve haplotypes, if you want to decide if a variant is real or if it's an artifact, if you're trying to decide that this doesn't smell right because whenever I see support for it, it's always on the same strand. In any one study, it's hard to be sure. It could happen for any variant in any one study, but if you see the variant in many studies and the support is always in a particular strand, then it becomes quite dubious that it's real. Uh, if you're able to process data centrally and there's a new analysis that's possible, a new set of analysis tools, you can allow those benefits to percolate to data that was generated previously and across studies. Um, I think right now we're actually in the situation where it's technically feasible to, to, to call tens of thousands of samples. Uh, you know, Mark, uh, the PRISO outlined how they, they've recently done this for 16,000 exomes. Uh, you know, I know Internally, we've called something like eight or 9,000 exomes at a time. So we're very close to those numbers. Uh, and so I think it, it, this, is, this is really feasible. And it's uh, especially so if we're willing to be happy with 80% solutions. You know, when you imagine, for example, calling uh, data that's been deposited across many projects, uh, you know, there's always issues with dealing with legacy data. If you say, Ah, I need to include all the data. That might mean, well, you need to include data on Solid, which is a platform that's now obsolete and no one is uh, developing. Or it might be you need to support very short reads that are only 30 bases or so and that are now no longer generated. So if you're willing to say, you know, I'm going to set aside big swaths of the data that greatly reduce the complexity of the problem, then, then, then this is probably quite doable. Uh, you know, to, to make this uh, doable, you, you really need to spend time on, you know, how is it possible to access sequence data across uh, many studies. Uh, if these analyses require manual intervention, 
it, it, they become much, much harder. And, uh, you know, and, and we need to, to really be realistic about what the challenges of dealing with corner cases are. You know, are we willing to say that we will drop many types of legacy data because the reads are too short, because the higher rates are a bit higher, because they use platforms that are not being actively developed for? Uh, and, and I think, you know, quality control for these kinds of analysis is also quite important. You know, one, uh, one experience that, uh, you know, many people in the room are aware of in the Thousand Genome Project, you know, we a few months ago found out that th there was a set of five or six samples that were, that had sequence data with a little bit lower quality, and these accounted for five to 10 percent of all our Indel calls in the project. You know, so a very small number of samples, a little bit lower data quality, and until we had the right filters in place to pick them out, they were distorting results for, for the whole project by quite a bit. Um, I think related to, to, the, to these ideas, uh, and I think something that's worth thinking about, is that there are certain types of information, you know, and the little frequencies are one example, but there's a few other types of information that uh, can allow uh, many of the benefits of joint calling without requiring you to share raw sequence data. So uh, you could imagine having some distilled view of the haplotype structure uh, of, uh, of different samples you've sequenced before, and that if you now sequence a new sample and try and place the sample within that haplotype structure, you'll be able to, to call it much better uh, without actually having to access the, the raw haplotypes for all the previous samples. Uh, you could imagine that if at each base you annotated, you know, what's my current evidence for each possible variation at this site across many th thousands or tens of thousands of samples. Now when I look at data from a new project, I can use that as my prior for variation, and that will uh, in improve the quality of my calling, even if I don't look at the raw sequence data for all these previous projects. Um, I think the risks of sharing these derivatives are similar to those involved in sharing allele frequencies, and if we, if we do move uh, ahead with the idea that it's okay to share a little frequencies for very large sample sets. We should explore what sorts of these derivatives can be generated and can be easily shared to facilitate um, analysis of new sequence data. Okay, uh, I think this is my last slide. And so I think I'd expect that all these options actually are likely to be tried first, not in um, a central repository setting, but probably uh, by investigators that have some shared scientific interests. If you have uh, uh, a group of investigators that's studying, let's say, the genetics of lipid levels or diabetes or schizophrenia, they have a very strong incentive to say, hey, what happens if we combine data across our parallel projects that all have information about this trait? You know, they have a strong incentive to say, what happens if we just take the the raw calls, what happens if we try and analyze the data in parallel ways, or what happens if we try and actually put the data in one place and analyze it together. And I expect that that's where we're going to see these analyses uh, piloted first. Um, I think, you know, currently, even if you look at the, the simple things that can be done with meta analysis, we're not really explaining what can be done with data that's, for example, deposited in dbGaP. You know, there's probably not that much sequence data there yet. Lots of this data is still being generated in the process of being deposited and so on. But there's, you know, tons of uh, data on genome-wide association studies. And even when those studies look at, have traits in common, most of the time, you know, there, there has been no meta-analysis, even a cursory one, to say, you know, what's the, our current status of knowledge for, for a particular trait. Um, now, I, I do think there are exciting things that can be done if, uh, if we combine data across projects, and I think this is worth pursuing. So I think this is basically the summary that I had. So. Yeah, David. So I start to get the sense that data processing is almost like an art, right? If you do it and I do it, no matter how hard we try, we won't do it the same way. You may use different files, and so well, while you say one part, we will be getting to these centralized servers. Another thing that that's a variation of the options you described is pre-bundled 
packages of standards in which you hit run and you get the same result, I get the same result. And, and what that requires is putting together a hodgepodge of tools and getting together the licenses, but to have a release, not of a genome, but of a, a, a variant calling um, approach. Um, has there been any conversations about not just standardizing in terms of a recipe, but standardizing in terms of a prepackaged, you know, um, set of options and all the other things go with it? Right. So I think, um, so I, th I think that you know conversations about that are are important, and and it is hard to translate these calling platforms between centers or between different analysis sites. And, and that's one of the reasons that many people think the cloud is attractive, right? If I can define some calling process on the cloud, I might have a, a virtual image of what's required to do those calls, and I can then share it, and you can plug in your data and pay for the compute time and call it with the exact same process. Uh, I mean, I, I honestly think that right now, if you look at where we are, the the biggest issues are not the differences in calling. There's many analyses that we could do despite the differences in calling that right now don't happen because it's hard to, to access the data across projects and so on. Uh, I think if we, if we just made sure that everyone called with the same set of tools, we would still have all those other issues to resolve. Yep. But I, <laughs> I think um, it, I actually think if, if we were resource unlimited, um, and had the software engineering bandwidth to produce tools of the sort you said. Like someone asked earlier yesterday, you know, does this have to be centralized or could it be possibly a distributed model? And I think what you're saying is right, that in some sense if you had tools that were sufficiently transportable that they could go to different people's settings, run on their computers, be, you know, sure to give the same output, you could achieve, you could do some of the processing in a distributed manner and combine if you could, in particular, you have to figure out how to share the information on error modes and sites that you get from large collections, which is part of the different outcome we might get. In other words, it might be that running the same exact software tools on 10 batches of 1,000 samples does not give the same answer as running that same set of software tools on 10,000 samples because of the borrowing of information. But, but nonetheless, I think there's a implementation challenge as there is even for creating one, for each, any given group to create one such environment to then package their tools so they can be guaranteed to run on anyone else's computers, to have the, someone talked about help desk support, so that when someone puts it on a machine that's not fast enough or not configured correctly, it runs. You know what I mean? It's not that it's not a good idea, because I think it actually would be a better outcome. It's just that much hard, to my mind, that much harder to implement. I don't think it's that hard to put together the set of tools we use, tar them up. You know, most people use Unix-based computers and to have input of a fast queue and output of a VCF by which but you've at least stabilized the version and some of the things you used along the way to so build an annotation. It, it, this gets complex because these tools typically are not designed to process one sample. The challenge is if I have you know, 10,000 samples to process, I'm going to process them in some clustering environment, and my clustering environment is probably very different from David's and from yours and I have to coordinate how jobs are scheduled and how they're divided, and they have many moving parts. I think that's part of the, but uh, Mark. Well, uh, I think, you know, the, that, the, this particular aspect of the implementation data processing could be done in such a fashion, but I don't think that that's really responsive to, you know, the, the mission of this meeting to create a repository whereby we can share data and benefit across studies. We could develop the types of, you know, clinical querying systems that benefit from tens of thousands of genomes having been sequenced and interpreted in one place, and centralized tools for the community of people that aren't us who could possibly do all that data processing ourselves, but really need, you know, some centralized tools to access the fruits of our labors. So uh, do you get requests for uh, interpretation of individual genomes in clinical or research applications that you are feeding into your process and using your variant callers for, Gonzalo? Um, you know, we, we do get such requests. It, it, I, I would say that it's really not my area of expertise. So I think, you know, how we, you know, how we inform, how we, you, you know, we have limited ability to to answer those kinds of requests. But I guess the more general question is, 
is the aggregation that you're talking about directed towards that problem in any way? Or I should see. we just sort of set it aside if we're going to start to think about well, that I problem? Okay, so I think if, if you're able to aggregate data across many genomes and analyze it systematically, it informs many problems. And I guess the problems that I highlighted at the beginning were mostly research problems. How do you discover a variant is associated with a particular trait and so on? Or how you discover regions of the genome under selection? Uh, I, th I think it also greatly informs uh, you know, annotation of individual genomes. It's different if you see a variant, if you know that the variant is present in many individuals or just in your genome. It's different if you, um, if you know that this is a gene that commonly varies with, you know, similar types of variants or if your variant is unique for that gene or for that functional element. But, uh, you know, interpreting an individual genome is, uh, I think, is incredibly challenging right now. You know, I. I I, I, I do spend a little bit of time talking with people who do this for a living, uh, and uh, you know, and I would say that for most kinds of things and for most genomes, even when they know there's a Mendelian disorder in the family, it's not clear how you interpret what you but see. I think, I think I think it's not really responsive in some way to Richard's question. It may be that today it's challenging to do, but I don't think, and maybe everyone in the room has different points of view, but. I would say that, at least in some people's minds, Richard, the answer is yes, this is related to the challenge of how you'll do, that people do ask for that, and if we think about how to create such a system, it's going to have to involve how you compare that genome to other genomes and reference knowledge bases that you have. So, Mark and then Carlos. Uh, I was just saying, you know, we have been doing that, Richard, with, you know, Mendelian families and with, you know, some individual cases that our colleagues at Mass General have sequenced in terms of combining that data, use, reusing Mark's tools in the system that he described to reanalyze those exomes and have gotten, you know, really helpful results on a technical level that we then carry forward into those types of analyses. So I think this is something we should be thinking about. Carlos. So just Two points. One, and I guess in response to Richard's question, it's certainly possible that a central analysis server could serve that function where you act as, as a broker for people who have clinical data. You could query the database, say, has anyone seen this variant? And you could even get information on what study that variant was seen in. So you could contact potentially, a, you know, if you have a clinical reference laboratory that, that could be connected in, in that way. And I think to the, to the question of aggregating, for doing pipeline analysis. In, in my mind, it's similar to the early days of genotype calling, where if you wanted to call the rare variants, you had to have, you know, enough to train the cluster. But eventually, I think some of this will stabilize once you have, say, 100,000, you know, sequence genomes then, in fact, I don't think there'll be that much variation from analysis to analysis for the N plus one genome. So I think there's a sort of transition phase that we need to think about, but then longer term, we have to go towards being able to do clinical interpretation in in what will eventually probably be a HIPAA environment so that people can get results back. And, and I think that gets to, there are two issues, so that, that there's joint calling, and there's a real value to that, and I don't take away from that value. But then there's also the aspect of smaller numbers that need to be called as samples, yet it's still important to share those and centrally put those together, because I don't think people will redo joint analysis with every new sample. So. There's two things that I guess I, I'm focusing on, not taking away from the, the mm -hmm. importance or value of joint. One thing I, I think is worth pointing I mean, there's two issues with joint calling, and I think, you know, there's the clear thing on sensitivity. I mean, you can learn about the alleles from one sample and genotype in another. But also you get enormous improvements in specificity because errors that, sites that are errorful in one sample, you often gain lots of power to identify as an error, and in fact, across multiple samples, you have a common error. And that is actually what I worry about a lot with clinical sequencing. If you're doing single samples, then what you're really doing is not just missing some small number of variants, because you can trump that to some degree with depth. It's that you have systematic artifacts that really can only be removed by looking across many samples. So a good example of this is, you know, cryptic duplications that are in Hardy-Weinberg disequilibria across lots of samples. I mean, how, you could never know from a single sample that this yeah. is happening. So I think the other point is, I, you know, I think Carlos's point about the N plus one genome is actually quite important. Because if you, if you do have 100,000 sequence genomes, there's probably a set of summaries of those that you could 
imagine deriving that makes it easier to call the 100,000 first genome almost as well as if you'd analyzed it jointly with all the other ones. David. Yeah, I just don't think we should assume that there's two modes, one of which is we do joint calling and one is we do one-off genomes any more than, I mean, again, we live in a world where like five minutes after anything happens in the world, it's completely web crawled and accessible to every one of us. There's no doubt that systems could be developed, again, whether we'll invest enough to develop them such that maybe not every n plus one genome, but every night or something like that, you figure out how to update the analyses, you have the value as if you had done calling on all of them and you've added in incrementally. Otherwise, I think we're, we'll be delivering a much worse clinical product than the research product because we, be we won't be benefiting from all the things we've learned. 